Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. It's a beautiful place. Uh, breakfast on the beach was a nice contrast from the snow at home last week. So uh, just out of curiosity, how many people here in the room are surgeons? Okay, so fairly small number. So I was asked to give a talk on uh, surgical management of ulcerative colitis in about 20 minutes. So I'm going to try and highlight kind of some brief overview of what we think about as surgeons, kind of key points when we're thinking about the surgical management uh, of ulcerative colitis. So I'm going to start, uh, start right into it. So number one principle, severity dictates the options for patients with ulcerative colitis. So what I mean by that is here's a case, case number one. So this is a 33-year-old female uh, in the emergency room, 10-year history, has been on maintenance therapy, but now presents febrile, tachycardic, hypotensive, you get a CT scan and the cecum's dilated to 13 centimeters. So in this situation, this is an emergent situation for the operating room. So the severity of the disease is dictating your options. Um, the next step, IV steroids, no, not likely. Infliximab, no. So really the option is to proceed to the operating room. So when do you call the surgeon? In this case, it's right away. Um, when is a case considered emergent? So colonic perforation, hemorrhage, toxic megacolon, fulminate colitis. In this situation, you are not going to be performing a pouch. So in this situation, it's an emergent colectomy. And the challenge is, when, in this situation, when you're called to the bedside for the first time as a surgeon, you really don't have a lot of time to talk to the patient about surgical options and J pouch and what to expect. You're taking the patient to the operating room for a colectomy. You tell them their morbidity and mortality is increased, but you have limited window to communicate. So that's why you bring them back at a later stage when they're healthier to do your J-pouch and talk to them and counsel them about a J-pouch. So how do you optimize, setting, uh, optimize your outcomes in an emergent setting? Well, there's really not a lot of room for preoperative optimization. You might think about fluid status or think about blood products if they're severely anemic, but you're not thinking about nutrition and optimizing their medications. Um, Ideally, use a laparoscopic approach, even in the emergent setting, it will make the pouch operation much easier and the ability to use a minimally invasive approach, which I'll get to later. And then the main thing in this operation is what do you do with your rectal stump? So when we do the colectomy, we leave behind the rectal stump because we don't want to go into the pelvis when the patients are so sick. But that stump, even when you oversew it, is at very high risk for breakdown. Um, so sometimes we'll bring it up and tack it to the fascia. And then that way, if it does blow out, it'll just be an abscess that we can drain. Other times, we can leave a rectal drain. Number two principle. So medically refractory to patients really need to be multi um, optimized and managed in a multidisciplinary fashion. So these are the patients where GI and surgery really should have a lot of interaction and a lot of discussion. It's a difficult situation because we don't know the optimal timing of when to go to surgery. There's not a black and white rule of, okay, this patient now goes to the operating room. It's a lot of discussion and there's a lot of gray area. So here's an example of a case of an urgent colectomy or a patient that's admitted. So they're admitted to the hospital with an acute flare. So 27-year-old male, he was admitted three days ago to the hospital. He's mildly febrile, a little tachycardic. He has some tenderness, has an increase in bowel movements, a bit on infliximab, endoscopy shows severity of disease. So what are the next steps in this situation? And this is what I mean, it's a little bit more of a gray area. So is the patient put on IV steroids? Are they given induction therapy, infliximab, cyclosporum, what's the induction now? And when do we go to the operating room? So when do you make the decision, okay, today's the day we are going to operate, the patient is now medically refractory. And the challenge is it's really a balancing act because when you look at the data, Induction, induction therapy with cyclosporine and infliximab is actually quite good even for steroid refractory patients. So we can prevent a lot of colectomies with medical therapy. So a lot of patients may not even need surgery, or at least at that hospitalization, they may not need surgery. But the challenge is the earlier we do surgery, the better the outcomes. So if we do surgery early, we have less morbidity and less mortality. So it becomes weighing which of these two options. And again, that's why the importance of the discussion between the surgeon and gastroenterologist. So the third principle in surgery for UC, call the surgeon early. Even if you're not gonna need us, you may not even need a colectomy at this admission, but at least it gives us a chance to communicate with the patient, not in this state. So at least we can go to the bedside, we can talk to the patient about a colectomy, about a J-pouch, what the risks are, what the anticipated function is after their J-pouch, how many bowel movements are they gonna have during the day, what's their chance of leakage. 
So these things are important to have in a conversation when the patient is not so sick and being rushed to the operating room. So the earlier that we can be called and involved in the discussion, I think the better, not only for the patient outcomes, but just so they can have expectations about surgery. So in this setting, the urgent patient that's admitted to the hospital is quite sick, but it's not emergent, which operation do we choose? Do we choose a one-stage pouch, a two-stage pouch where we do the colectomy and come back at a later time, or a three-stage? And why is this important? Well, this is important because pelvic sepsis is the leading cause of pouch failure. So when we make a pouch, we want optimal conditions so the patient doesn't have a leak, because if they leak, they get pelvic sepsis, that impacts function, and that leads to pouch loss. So it's really important at this stage to pick how you, do, how you stage your operation, how you stage your pouch operation. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of data comparing stages of operations, so there's a few papers that have compared a two-stage versus a three-stage. So there's no randomized control trials looking at this, but the six studies that have looked at this suggest that a three-stage approach, which is colectomy as your first stage, pouch with diversion at the second stage, and then reversal of your diversion at the third stage with restoration of intestinal continuity, that is better in a high-risk patient. So then, who is high risk? Who should you be doing this in? Well, patients that are on corticosteroids, probably biologics, but that's a little bit controversial, uh, poor nutritional status, or acute, severe, severe colitis. So when we look at data with corticosteroids, we see that corticosteroids preoperatively are associated with pouch sepsis. The translation is pouch loss. So if the patient is on high dose steroids or they've been on chronic steroids, a three-stage approach is probably better. Again, this is reinforcing that. So these are the ECHO guidelines that state failure to wean from prednisone 20 daily prior to surgery should postpone pouch construction. Do a colectomy if they're on steroids, not a pouch. What about TNF therapy? The literature is very controversial on this. So there's papers that say there's no increase in pelvic sepsis of the pouch. Other papers that say, yes, it makes the pouch construction uh, more dangerous when you're on anti-TNF therapy. I think the point of this is because it's controversial, there's really no harm in waiting. So if you're taking the patient to the operating room, if you're gonna do a pouch, wait. Wait and do that until they've been off anti-TNF therapy. So three stage them, do the colectomy first. Again, echo guidelines, avoid the use of a single stage proctocolectomy. So basically, avoid making your pouch if they're on anti-TNF therapy. Uh, Vetalizumab, there's limited data, it's controversial, similar findings to anti-TNF where some papers show no increased adverse events, others show increased intra-abdominal abscesses. Our own data at Mayo showed inter increased intra-abdominal abscesses in the setting of making a pouch when exposed to vetalizumab. So just wait, three-stage these patients. Um, malnutrition, the same thing, so poor, poor oral intake has higher postoperative mortality. TPM, we don't really know the benefit. So if a patient is severely malnourished, again, three-stage. So principle number four, a three-stage is probably the best and the safest thing to do in a high-risk patient. So you're just making the pouch construction at a time when the patient is better optimized. Uh, what about this third case? So this is more of the elective setting. So this is the patients that we're seeing in an outpatient situation. So this might be a message that I got. This is one message from about six months ago. You know, thank you, this is from the gastroenterologist. Thank you for seeing this patient tomorrow. This is a medically refractory patient. They've been on these various biologics. The workup has included enterography to rule out any evidence of Crohn's, a sigmoidoscopy to rule out CMV and C. diff. Now we're seeing this patient, it's time to discuss surgery. So this is again, when do we call the surgeon? So when do the gastroenterologist call us to come talk to the patient? What's the appropriate time? Again, I would argue early. So if I see this patient in clinic, perhaps they decide, I really don't want surgery, I wanna try tofacitinib. That's fine, but at least we can have the discussion so they know what to expect if tofacitinib doesn't work. Uh, when do we take the patient to the operating room? And when is a pouch versus the other options appropriate? So in the elective setting, patient-specific factors really can drive the operation. So now it's not so much the severity of the disease, not an emergent colectomy, but there are certain considerations, I think, about each patient to individualize not only our medical therapy, we have to individualize surgical therapy as well. So what about obesity? If a patient is obese, it is exceedingly difficult to make a pouch because the mesentery is so thickened that it's hard to get the pouch to reach into the pelvis. 
So the mesentery and the length of the mesentery really drives our ability to make a pouch. So when the patient is obese, the mesentery around the SMA, around that vessel, is very thick and it makes the surgery very, very difficult. So in those patients, the risk of not being able to construct a pouch in the operating room and then having a, temper or a permanent ileostomy is much higher. So if you see a patient that is obese, perhaps think about three-staging them. Do the colectomy first, have them lose weight. That will significantly improve their chances of not only being able to construct a pouch, but also having better outcomes. Um, prior abdominal surgery. So if you're seeing a patient that has had a number of abdominal surgeries, maybe they've had a gastric bypass, maybe a hysterectomy, maybe surgeries are not even related to IBD, it will likely make your surgery much harder. So you just have to counsel the patient that perhaps pouch construction is gonna be more difficult. Women of childbearing age. So a lot of times I will get questions from young females. If I get a pouch, am I not going to be able to get pregnant or not be able to have children? No, that's not the case. In the US, the rate of infertility is about 12%. After a pouch, it does go up slightly to 18%. Uh, but one thing you can counsel them on or discuss with them is they can delay pouch formation and have their colectomy and come back later for their pouch after they've had children. That does help fertility rates. The other thing is as a surgeon, if we do this, the surgery laparoscopically, fertility is far less affected. So there's less adhesive disease around the ovaries, around the uterus. It, makes, it impacts them significantly less with regard to fertility. So again, another reason to do minimally invasive approaches for surgery. Uh, what about patient age? So if an elderly patient comes to you and they have refractory disease, it's not a contraindication to do a pouch. However, you would want to ask them about their bowel function. Do they have any incontinence at baseline? And also look at their comorbidities. It may be that an older patient is better served with a proctocolectomy and endileostomy rather than a pouch. So something, again, individualize the surgery to the patient. Another important thing is anal sphincter tone. So you don't necessarily ask a UC patient about frequency or if they're having accidents because if they're having 20 bowel movements a day, they probably are having some element of incontinence, or they may be. But you can get anal, re anal rectal manometry. You can also assess their tone on physical exam. If they have poor tone, it's not going to be a patient that does well with the pouch. So again, proctocolectomy, endileostomy. The good thing about a total proctocolectomy and an endileostomy versus a pouch, quality of life is actually equivalent. So the big studies looking at meta-analyses and prospective studies, that actually the quality of life with a proctocolectomy and endileostomy is actually quite good. So in the older patient or a patient with underlying incontinence and poor tone, a proctocolectomy is a good option. Quality of life is good. What about intraoperative considerations during pouch surgery? Use a minimally invasive approach. It will definitely improve the outcomes, improve fertility for young females, improve multiple subsequent operations. So there are many different approaches. You can do a hand assist, you can do straight laparoscopy, or a robotic approach. Doesn't necessarily matter which one, whatever the surgeon's most comfortable with, but a minimally invasive approach certainly has a number of advantages. Uh, there's decreased wound infections, decreased post-operative morbidity, improved cosmetic results in a younger patient, and also increased fertility rates. Key when you're operating for the surgeons in the room to minimize tension on the anastomosis. It doesn't matter if you're doing an open operation or if you're doing a robotic operation. See the anastomosis while you're doing it and minimize tension. If you, may, if you construct an anastomosis and there is tension, that will fall apart, it will leak, you will have pelvic sepsis. Sometimes you have to do certain maneuvers in the operating room to increase the length and the mesentery. Uh, there's another, a number of intraoperative maneuvers that we can do. The idea is decrease the tension on the anastomosis. Preserve, preserve that anastomosis. A stapled approach is generally preferred. So it used to be back when the pouch first started being constructed, everyone did a hand sewn. So they did a mucosectomy of the rectal cuff, did not want to leave any mucosa behind, and did a hand sewn anastomosis. However, if you look at function between a hand sewn anastomosis and a stapled anastomosis, Hands sewn generally have more stenosis and the function is not as good. So higher frequency, higher leakage rates. So we do try and do a stapled anastomosis. So it does leave behind a small rectal cuff. So there's been question about, well, in FAP patients or patients with dysplasia, what should we do? When we actually look at the data and look at a hand sewn versus a stapled anastomosis and look at neoplasia of the pouch, mucosectomy does not eliminate the risk. 
And for sake of time, I didn't include it, but the challenge is when you do a mucosectomy, most oftentimes you leave behind islands of tissue that then when you bring the pouch down, it just covers that island of tissue. So doing a mucosectomy is not a perfect fix to prevent dysplasia of the pouch subsequently. Number eight, consider novel treatment approaches to optimize outcomes. So I'm just gonna show you a few things that are in the literature recently, um, things that surgeons that we talk about at the surgical meetings, just to highlight, because you may see this in your medical practice or when you're talking to some of your surgeons. So one thing is this question of appendectomy, does that prevent colectomy in patients with UC? Uh, this concept of rescue fecal diversion, a transanal approach, and a modified two-stage. So I'm just gonna do about a slide on each of these to highlight some of the up-and-coming literature. So appendectomy for UC, there is not great data on this. Um, I did just review a paper recently that got accepted to BJS. So there's another randomized control trial, which you'll see soon. But in this paper, uh, in JCC just this year, patients that had an appendectomy with medically refractory ulcerative colitis, so patients that were going to be getting colectomy, instead of colectomy, they got an appendectomy alone. A third of those patients actually did not have to have a colectomy. So there may be something to this. The trial design of this study, there were several limitations, but I think there'll be more studies coming out on this, some of them randomized, looking at if you have a patient with refractory disease doing a simple appendectomy may actually save their colon. Something we're thinking about, it's interesting. Um, this is a paper from UCLA in California, and they looked at this concept of just diverting. So patients that were admitted that had severe, severe colitis, could you just bring up a loop ileostomy and preserve their colon? And they actually prevented emergent colectomy, so they made the colectomy in a more elective setting, which was good, um, but they actually prevented having to do a colectomy in a lot of patients. So some of the patients, they were able to reverse their ileostomy after getting them on medical therapy. So again, something to consider if you had a patient that was a poor operative candidate, maybe you take them and just divert them. Um, another thing is various stages of iliopouchial anastomosis. So I talked about a two-stage versus three-stage. In Europe is the main place they are doing this. It's called a modified two-stage. So basically they're doing the colectomy at the first stage when the patient is sick. When they come back to do the pouch, they don't do a diversion. So something to think about, that way it's only two operations. The challenge is the literature to date when they've looked at this, the patient's selected. It makes it difficult to compare a three-stage versus a modified two because there's patient selection bias. So healthier patients are undergoing this modified two-stage, but you may hear some of the surgeons talking about modified two, which just means colectomy first, pouch second, with no diversion. And then the last thing is, this is a new technique that's being used, it's more for the surgeons in the room, but uh, transanal iliopouch anastomosis, which is actually a great technique. So what you do is you have a single port, a single, single port here in your ostomy site. So you do colectomy through a single port. That's where your ostomy is going to be. You do the rectal dissection from above, and then you go down below, and you complete this, the dissection from below. And what's nice about that is you have complete control over where you put your anastomosis. So it's the same location every time. It's a single staple line, which may prevent leaks also. I'm just going to show this. I'm not going to show the whole video, because for sake of time, it's five minutes. But... I just wanted to show you a little bit of what it looks like, if I'm able to. So basically this is uh, one of the port sites. This is the patient's head up here, patient's feet down here. This is the port site at the ileostomy. I'm just gonna kind of forward through this, I think, if I'm able to. I'm not sure how the video works from up here. <laughs> This is putting an additional working port in. Okay, maybe I won't be able to go through it quickly. So this is actually doing the, the proctectomy, so taking out the rectum. This is the total mesorectal excision. So sacrum is down here. You get into this nice plane to lift the rectum up and off in a total mesorectal excision. This is just taking the mesentery to the, to the rectum here. So doing the dissection from above. Are you able to fast forward to the video from there? Probably not. So this is down below. So this is a port that's put in the anus. You can see this patient has severe disease. And this is called a purse string suture. So we have 
basically a port that's going in the anus and just above the dentate line. So again, we have complete control over the distance of the rectal cuff or the length of the rectal cuff. So we put in this purse string suture to basically close off the rectum. So now the, the rectum is sealed. And then we mark out where we're going to start with our rectal dissection from a below. But what's nice about that is, again, you have complete control over where your anastomosis is going to be. So it's at the same height every single time, which we don't have complete control over when we're doing laparoscopy from above. So this gets marked out. And then basically the dissection comes from below. We bring the pouch down to the anastomosis. So just another thing that's going to be coming up that you may see your surgeon's doing more of. There's only been one study to date looking at an abdominal approach versus this transanal approach. It does look like the leak rate is decreased, so there's many centers now using this approach, and I think as more data comes out, we'll see if there's actually an advantage with this surgical approach. Uh, so in conclusion, severity of disease dictates the operation. So emergent colectomy in patients with severe, severe disease. Don't make a pouch in that setting, that's a colectomy in the emergent setting. Medically refractory patients really require both GI and surgeons to be heavily involved when they're admitted to the hospital, call surgery early so that we can have a discussion with the patient about risks and benefits and what to expect. Um, a three-stage approach is probably the safest in those high-risk patients on steroids, biologics, or malnourished. Use a minimally invasive approach when you can. It's much better for the patient. Um, minimize tension on your anastomosis. There's maneuvers to create extra length. Stapled approach is probably preferred, likely better function, and really not a higher risk of neoplasia in the pouch. And then consider some of these novel, novel surgical approaches. I think we'll see more data on that soon. Thank you.